Thanks, Siri, and uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. It's uh, great being here in person again. And uh, yeah, I'll be telling you about learning Michelle Zagausen's uh, and how to do this robustly. Uh, and for the rest of the talk, the only assumption we'll make is that our data is captured, which obviously is OK. OK, so this is joint work with some wonderful co-authors, Elias Nicholas, Ejia, Daniel Kane, Karesh Patari, and Santosh Mpala. OK, so let me start by defining the problem of learning uh, mixture of Gaussians. So let's denote our input uh, as a set of n samples, x1 to xn, drawn from a mixture, which I'll denote by script m, uh, of k Gaussians. Uh, and the mixture is defined as follows. So if you want to sample n points from mixture k Gaussians, you do the following. You pick mixture i with probability wi. And the i, the i component of the mixture is a Gaussian with mean mu i and covariant sigma i. These mu i's and sigma i's can be arbitrary. And then you would draw a sample iid from this, this Gaussian. OK, and you get a set of samples uh, from this joint mixture. You don't know which sample came from which component. And the picture, to keep in mind, kind of looks like this. So you have these points, presumably in high dimensions. The color coding uh, is not known to you, but I've done it so that you know which when it corresponds to which component. And in general, you can't hope to recover the color coding because there could be some Gaussians that are completely overlapping and are almost completely overlapping, and you don't know which point came from which Gaussian. OK, so our goal is to then just output another mixture of K Gaussians. Let's denote this by M hat, such that this mixture is close to the original input uh, mixture of K Gaussians. OK, so let me formalize this a bit more. I want the mixture that we output, which is m hat, to be close to the initial mixture, m, in total variation distance. And recall, total variation distance is this notion of distance that measures overlap between probability distributions. To define it a bit formally, the total variation distance between distribution p and q is basically half of the integral of the point-wise distance difference between px and px. OK, so intuitively, this measures overlap between distributions. Since we can't recover the color coding, in general, it's reasonable to try to recover a distribution that overlaps with your input distribution. And this is, in some sense, the best you can hope for. So like I said, it captures overlap. And if you don't know anything about your input mixture, you can't hope to recover the color coding. So this is essentially information directly optimal. Like This is the best guarantee you can hope to optimize. OK, so that's the problem set up in the vanilla setting where I get clean samples makes sense. OK, great. So this problem um, has been well studied in theoretical computer science and theoretical machine learning. And it started out with this work of Das Gupta in 99. And it was followed up by several results which improved on this. But in general, this, this set of results learned the mixture when the means were well separated. So if I go back to this picture, these first set of results can cluster the points or learn mixtures where you know C3 and C5, the means are separated, so you can learn the mixture in this setting. So they make assumption about the means being separated. Okay, the second generation of results by Rubecker and Mambala were able to cluster or learn the coloring when the covariances or the means are separated. So you don't really need the mixtures to be far apart by in terms of means. But if there is a variance direction that separates them, you can still cross that. OK, so OK. At a high level, this means you make another assumption. And under this assumption, you can, you can solve the problem that I mentioned on the previous slide. And all of this culminated in this set of three breakthrough results by Kalai Moitaralian, Moitaralian, and Duncan and Sinha in 2010 that showed that you can really learn the problem that I mentioned before without any assumptions on the mean and covariance. So you take a mixture of arbitrary Gaussians, you can learn a distribution that is close to the input in total variation distance without any options. Okay, and uh, these set of works rely on the algebraic structure of uh, Gaussians. In particular, they exploit polynomial relationships of moments of Gaussians. So moments of Gaussians, think of them as generalizations of the mean and covariance. Um, it's not really important exactly what the formalization is. But what this set of results is saying is that the problem as I set up we can come up with efficient polynomial time algorithms to solve the problem. OK, so what we'll be interested in is, is solving a robust variant of this problem, where our data isn't completely Gaussian. 
So let's say our data is 90% drawn from a mixture of Gaussians, and the rest of the data is arbitrary. And we would still like to figure out the parameters of the underlying Gaussians. Okay, so let me give some background for why such a model is interesting. So this model of robustly learning uh, distributions was initiated by Tukin Huber back in the 60s, uh, and it models the following situation. So you know, a fraction of the input data, say 10%, is contaminated, and this could be possible because you know there were systematic errors in data collection, or your data has outliers, or an adversary comes along and gets to tamper with your data in some sensitive settings, and so on. Okay, and the statistics community studied this this model of robustness and designed statistical estimators um, to solve basic problems like regression, learning a mixture of Gaussians, and so on. But the focus in this community has been to design statistical estimators that need not be computationally efficient. And really, there has been a lot of progress. In fact, there are multiple books on this topic that design such statistical estimators. The question that we are interested in is, can you make these efficient? Uh, you know, can we come up with polynomial time algorithms that do not depend on the dimension, like do not grow exponentially in the dimension, especially since we're interested in like high dimensional setups? Okay. So that's the motivation. And the central question that we were interested in is does there exist an efficient algorithm? Here by efficient, I mean the algorithm's running time doesn't grow exponentially with the dimension. Do robustly learn a mixture of K Gaussians in the presence of outliers? Okay, so I haven't formalized the problem yet, but hopefully, you know, at a high level, this question makes sense. Um, and we were not the first people to ask this question. In fact, this question has been around for a while. Um, the first I heard of it was when I was at Simon's Institute in the fall of 20, 2018. They had this program on foundations of the science. And uh, one of the main questions that was highlighted in this program was this one where can you learn a mixture of arbitrary Gaussians without making any assumptions on the means and covariances, but can you do it in the presence of adversarial algorithms? Okay. And this is just an excerpt from that uh, program. Okay. So let me tell you about some prior work on this problem, and there's been a lot. Uh, oh, just yeah. A quick question. So, so uh, here you were interested in learning each component uh, in total variation distance, or the whole mixture is approximate. Right. right. So if I make absolutely no assumptions to start with, I can't hope to learn each component because there could be components that are indistinct. Uh, but I will discuss this in more detail and draw the distinction between these two problems where you can learn the whole mixture in total variation distance or whether you can learn a component by component. Yeah, just two slides. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so let me tell you a bit about prior work on robustly learning GMMs. Um, in the statistics community by 2010, uh, 2020, uh, Astiani et al. proved tight sample complexity bounds on the Basically, they say exactly how many samples you need in order to learn a mixture of Gaussians uh, up to total variation error, as I defined previously. And this also works in the setting where there are adversarial outliers. Okay, but this result is not computationally up. Okay, in, in the context of designing efficient algorithms, several special cases of this problem have been studied, uh, starting with these breakthrough results of diagonal class, common team, Lee, Winter, Stewart and lie around Impala in 2016, that's study the case of a single Gaussian. So you want to estimate the mean and covariance of one Gaussian, and you want to do this in the presence of outliers. So they show a polynomial time algorithm to do this. That is, since this paper came out, there's been a flurry of work in this area, uh, and the next set of results will show how to do mean separated mixtures. So we're following the timeline in the non-robust setting, where you know, we start off with you know, estimating the parameters of a single Gaussian non-robustly, then we handle the mean separated case, and then we handle the mean and covariance separate case, and so on. So we'll follow the same timeline here. Uh, following up on this work, we were able to show with Pravesh Kanari and this concurrent uh, diacritical asset at all paper that even in the non spherical case, where, you know, the it need not be that the means are separated, but the covariances could also be separated, we can still solve this problem. In 2021, Kane showed a result where if you pick a mixture of two Gaussians and you weight them equivalently, like you have the same probability of picking either one of them, you can solve the problem. And then following up on, on Kane's result, there was a result by Leon Wintra that generalizes to the case of K Gaussians, but required a bound on the mixing weights. 
uh, and the variance of each component. So what I'm trying to get across from this slide is that there's been a lot of work on special cases of this problem, which has already been very uh, algorithmically uh, interesting. Okay. So let me tell you what our main result is. Our main result says if you're, if you're given a corrupted sample from an arbitrary Gaussian mixture, so no assumptions on the means, covariances, or the mixing weights, there is an efficient algorithm that recovers a mixture that is close to the uncorrupted input. Okay, so this is our result in English. I haven't formalized any parameters yet, but at a high level, this is the main claim. And I claim that this resolves the open question that I presented a few slides ago. So any questions about this statement? Okay, good. And the second one goes back to Arvindan's question, which is a slightly stronger statement. It says, again, if you're given a contaminated sample from an arbitrary Gauss measure, there's an efficient algorithm that recovers the parameters of each component whenever it is information theoretically possible to do so. Okay. So you can cook up examples where you can re really just information theoretically not identify the parameters of you know, components because they could be exactly the same component and you can never hope to distinguish them. But what this second statement is saying is whenever it's information theoretically possible, we can algorithmically compute the parameters. Okay, any questions about this statement? Okay, so yeah. when we say it's information theoretically uh, possible, yeah. in, so uh, a circumstance where it's impossible is that uh, you have two components which are, you know, they don't look identical, but they are epsilon close in the relation. Right. Great question. You're, you're two slides ahead of me. This will, I will formalize exactly what that means in two slides. Great. Yeah. Um, one, well, I guess it's a similar question about when it, it's information theoretically possible. Yeah. Is there a blow up in the sample complexity here? Or it's like as soon as the number of samples are enough to get the like computationally unbounded algorithm to work, you can adapt. Right, so there, there's going to be a gap between the sample complexity, which I'll point out. But the existence of recovering parameters is not a property of the sample complexity. It's the property of the underlying mixture. Like I could have a mixture where components are so close that no matter how many samples you take, you can never figure out which point came from which component. Okay, so in that sense, you know, whenever it's information theoretically possible for the underlying mixture to have components that are identifiable, we'll be able to do it at the cost of more samples. Wait, so now let me actually formalize the problem setup and so that these terms uh, you know, kind of make sense and I can provide some parameters. So again, the input's the same. We have endpoints drawn from a mixture of k Gaussians. Uh, we make no assumptions about the mu i, sigma i, and w i's. But now an adversary comes along and designs another distribution that is close to this mixture of Gaussian distribution in total variation because epsilon plus in total variation distance. And the adversary draws endpoints from this corrupted distribution. Okay, and your algorithm gets to see these points y1 to yn. You can think of these set of points as you know, one minus epsilon fraction of them were drawn from the true distribution, and epsilon fraction of them are arbitrary. Okay, great. This is what your this is what your in, this is what your input it is, and your goal is to now output a mixture m hat, such that m hat is again close to the input mixture m in total variation distance. So this is the first version of the problem where I only care about outputting a mixture that is close in total variation distance to the input mixture. I'll not worry about component wise things for now. Epsilon flows in each yi, right? Not as a joint. No, as a joint distribution. Y1 to yn. That's right. That's right. So the adversary gets to corrupt the distribution itself, such that the distribution is epsilon close to the input mixture. So the overlap between the corrupted distribution and the input distribution has to be at most uh, the overlap, the non-overlap has to be at most epsilon. The other way to think about this is the set of samples by one to y n. One minus epsilon of them will look like the original sample is drawn from the true mixture, and an epsilon fraction will look like anything. Yes. But I guess the simplification that you can think of for the adversary is shifting slightly, and that every sample is slightly different. So that would be a weak adversary. I mean, that, that, that would make uh, or maybe I don't understand your question. So, so you could think of this thing as one minus epsilon being from the original distribution, epsilon being from the, uh, is that like 
that, that is fine, but like it can also be other places. Like every sample is because if you're drawing IID, so no, so if you shift every sample, your total variation distance between the two distributions is going to get larger, right? Like total variation distance really measures overlap between probability distributions. And total variation distance epsilon says there's only an epsilon measure set that is in one distribution and not in the other. So when I sample, I can only see an epsilon fraction of points, which is from this adversarial distribution. Okay. Yeah. So you would also have a model where you the adversary gets the samples and they corrupt like an epsilon fraction of it. So that's stronger than this, right? Right. Uh, this is here for a technical reason. Uh, that's the, that's a stronger model, but there's one step of our algorithm that does not work. I'll point out this one. Okay. Okay, so if you believe that model, now I'll restate our, our, our statement, our main theorem as follows. So we're given an epsilon corrupted set from this mixture M, and we have an algorithm that recovers another mixture, M tilde. So we provide you wi, mu y, et cetera, y, such that the following is true. So the total variation distance between M and M hat is a horrendous function of epsilon. But, but we will think of K as being a constant, in which case, this is poly epsilon. So we get something which is polynomially flows in epsilon uh, to the original input in total variation distance. The sample complexity of our algorithm scales as g to the k times a horrendous function of one over epsilon. This horrendous function is again going to be doubly exponential in k. The running time is linear, is, is, is polynomial in the number of samples uh, times a horrendous function of one over epsilon. And let me point out a few things about this result. So, so the sample complexity here, the dependence on D, on D is unavoidable. There is a statistical query lower bound by Diagon Nicholas K. Stewart that says like a D to the omega K dependence on samples is necessary. Another part of our algorithm that is really nice is that the running time is actually D to the O of K. And this improves on the best known non-robust algorithm for this problem, which was W exponential. Okay, so that's our first main result with all the parameters instantiated. Are there any questions about it? Yeah. The actual lower bound is for the work scale for non robust. Yeah, it's like a moment matching lower bound. Yeah. Is there some reason why? Uh, so, does your algorithm, if you just port it over to the, oh, we don't have any corruptions, is that like an improvement? Or is there some difference where you say, like, because we're assuming potential corruptions, we would actually classify this as a oh, I don't know, instance? No, no. Like if you if you set the fraction of outliers to be zero in our algorithm, you get a better algorithm for the non-robust problem. Does that make sense? Are there any lower bounds in terms of epsilon? Um, in the sample complexity? Let's say SQ is lower than. Right, so I, I suppose like a poly one over epsilon lower bound is not so hard. I think that the key here is you really want to improve this dependence of the k in, in the exponent of the epsilon. But one over epsilon to the k should be better. Right. Oh, okay, but the k is constant. Poly one, by poly one over epsilon. Constant. Yeah. In the constant regime, I mean, this would be pretty much as close to best possible. Uh, but you can still hope to improve this. Like information theoretically, like the PV distance between the two distributions should be O tilde epsilon independent of K. Oh, I see. Because you're not looking to recover parameters. Exactly. Sorry, that was a technical aside. Uh, our recovery guarantee is some epsilon to the one over W exponential in K. But information theoretically, you could hope for just being like epsilon log one or epsilon close to the uh, and, and, and we don't know how to do that. That's an excellent open question. Okay, any other questions about this result? And if I, even if I uh, am less sure about SP low bonds, that's this results of regular and other skills or uh, another computation low bonds. So you can change the starting assumption and then get a D to the K lower bound if you believe in learning with that. Okay. Yes. Uh, so they're both K yeah, or mixtures. If like, let's say your assumption was wrong and like it actually, one is K over two and one of them is K, like um, it's your 
like the time complexity is based on whatever you're trying, like not the real distribution, right? The, the one you're learning. So K, the way I define the problem, K is given to you as part of the input, uh, and then you run for that K. But you can, you know, like guess and double and repeat this algorithm, and at some point, you know, you, you can. But, but, but if they were different, it'd be the complexity would be based on the one you're recovering. Uh, the complexity would be based on the one that's given to you as input. Mm -hmm. Like the correctness guarantee kind of scales with what the true K is, right? Like, so if the underlying mixture had Many components, you know, your correctness guarantee. Like, so that would imply there's no cost to assuming there's more case than there are, but the complexity doesn't grow with estimating a higher bandwidth. Oh, maybe I'm not understanding the question, but like the algorithm takes k as input. It could be the original k or something smaller or something larger, and it will run in double. Okay, now I think it's good. Okay, sorry for the interruption. I'm not sure. How much uh, was missed? Probably about a minute. Though. A minute? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you I'm gonna keep going and whatever was missed is probably not that important. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the result that I'm gonna show you is gonna be similar to the one that I already talked about. And there are minor differences and uh, we can ignore them. Okay, so let me actually tell you. The result in the statistically learnable case, in this case, if you know your input mixture is statistically learnable, we say that we can actually recover the parameters of each component, which means we can learn each component up, up to poly sub kf epsilon and total variation distance. We can recover each mixing weight up to poly sub kf epsilon. Uh, and the sample complexity is the same as the serum before. So this is just the strengthening of the previous serum. When you know that your input mixture has more structure in that it is information theoretically learnable. And the running time is still the same. Okay, so you get all of this. Uh, great. Are there any questions about this result before I get into the technical details? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so information theoretically is the sample complexity also p to the k. So not information directly. Information directly you can get away with like d squared. Term. Right, the SQ lower bound is for computationally efficient algorithms, which says if you believe SQ algorithms are some interesting class of algorithms, then you really need either the omega k numbers. Any other questions? So for uh, in your definition, statistical non learnable uh, regime, what does the lower bound look like? Uh, in a statistically non-learnable regime, you can never recover the parameters. So that's uh, that's why you define it as that's right. This is the minimum assumption under which you can recover parameters, and we show that you can. So, so, so uh, the previous result, result, the running time and the sample complexity were roughly the same. The same. The, the same algorithm does this when your input satisfies a strong okay. approach. Great. Okay, so let me move into uh, the technical overview of the talk. And here's what I'll try to tell you in the next half an hour or so. So I'll give you a high level description of our algorithm in the presence of no outliers. I'll tell you what, out, what obstacles appear if outliers come into the picture. And then I'll try, try to tell you this new technique that we came up with called, called list decodable density composition that we hope to uh, that we hope is like interesting in other scenarios, not just this one. Okay, so let me just jump into the algorithm without outliers. So let's say this is our picture of the input. So we see this data set, and we want to learn uh, a mixture that is close to this in total variation distance. Okay, so one natural thing to try to do is to try to separate out clusters of this mixture that are actually far. Right, like if the means are separated, such as the mean of this one and this one is separated, you should be able to separate them by just clustering. And then worry about each blob, which is unclusterable separately. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So step one is going to be cluster the components which are separated uh, to begin with. Right, so this gives you a picture that looks like this. Okay, now within each blob, these two mixtures are not clusterable, so we, we, we don't say anything about that, but at least across these blobs, 
we know that each component is separate. And then we'll deal with each one independently. Okay. So what's step two? Well, we focus on each blob. And on each blob, we try to learn the parameters in the blob itself. So we ignore all the other components. We focus on the first blob. And we try to learn the parameters in the blob. Okay, and the way we do this is to appeal to the non-robust algorithm, which would be to match the moments of the empirical moments of the distribution. So let me say a bit about what that means. But before I get into that, there's a theorem here by Moethe and Malia that says if a blob has k prime components, so k prime is almost at most k always, uh, matching k prime moments uniquely identifies the component. Okay, so we'll take this theorem for granted. It says like when you focus on one blob, you can just match, match the moments and still tell you the parameters. Let me explain what that means. Okay, so what is this magical property of matching moments? So if I look at these two components, let's say they have mean mu one and mu two and covariance sigma one and sigma two. The first, the first moment or the mean of this mixture of this blob is just this expression. It's W1 mu one plus W2 mu. And we know this equals to the empirical average of the sample that we see. Up to some point of actually, of course. That is error in sample collection. Okay, so that's the mean. Uh, I can write a similar expression for the covariance. And note that the right-hand side of these quantities, I can estimate them from the samples. Right? I can have in hand the samples xi that belong to these two components. I can create the empirical covariance and the empirical Okay, great. I can, I can repeat this. I can look at the third moment, fourth moment, and so on. And I'll get a system of polynomial equalities. Okay. And what this term is saying is that if you have, you know, K prime components or K prime unknowns, then setting order K prime polynomial equalities uniquely identifies them. So eventually you'll have an over constrained system. If you solve it, the parameters, the mu i's and sigma i's will be really the only parameters that satisfy the need. That's some intuition why method of moments works. So of course more complicated than that, but at a high level, it suffices to think about it this way. Okay, so now that's the high level algorithm in the presence of no outliers. Now let me say what complications arise in the presence of outliers. Unless there are any questions about this. Yes. Why well, was it important that you first divided and separated them? Right. Uh, it's going to be, so this is like the non-robust version of our algorithm. It's going to be important that when you restrict to one block, the coherences and means are bounded. Like you know what region of space they lie in. They lie in. I'll say why. It's like, we're going to do some kind of a net argument when we handle the non-robust, the robust setting. So we need the property that this is bounded. Like it can't be all spread out. Yeah. Do you have to also know how many Gaussians are in each of your blobs? No. No. There are at most k of them, trivially, because you know k was the input. And we'll just feed that extra factor f of k. Even if they're just two, we'll assume they're at most k. Yeah. And you may find each of them. That's right. Any other questions? Yeah. So saying that uh, if you don't have any outliers, you can apply this algorithm by itself on the entire mixture and you can get more. That's right. In general, you can apply this without the clustering step, but I'm giving you the clean like this, the analog of our algorithm in the non-robust setting. This also increases, like improves the length time, like doing these two steps improves the length. It's possible that your algorithm outputs more, uh, more uh, like a larger key mixture with a larger key than in the real mixture? No, it will output K being uh, yeah, exactly the same as this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in the robust case, are you assuming that the adversary knows your algorithm? Are you, or are you assuming that they don't know your algorithm? Like how powerful is your adversary in terms of constructing this instance? Oh, the, uh, uh, the adversary knows the algorithm. The adversary knows the algorithm. It's unbounded computationally. Yeah, the adversary knows everything, basically. You have some private randomness for that. Okay, so let me get into some obstacles in the presence of outliers. The first one is the clustering step. 
So how do we do this clustering step? Well, I'm going to skip this for the purposes of this talk because this was ha handled in a previous paper. Uh, and, and, and it's like a completely separate subroutine, but the subroutine says like this clustering step you can do in the presence of outliers. So I'm going to black box out this stuff. Uh, if you want to know some details of this, ask me offline. Uh, there's a slide here so I can show you. Just at a very high level, this relies on constructing a system of polynomial inequalities and considering a convex relaxation of the system of polynomial inequalities. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about that. Now I'm going to focus on the case where we want to learn the parameters of one block. Okay, and in the non-robust setting, recall that it suffices to set up the system of polynomial inequalities and find the set of parameters that satisfy the system. Great. Now, what an adversary can do is they can completely mess up your empirical estimates of the mean, the covariance, and the fourth moment, and so on. Right? Okay. But there is this really nice result by Kotari and Sturer that says if your input data is Gaussian, you can actually accurately estimate these empirical quantities. Of course, up to some error, which depends on the fraction of outliers, but this is still a reliable estimate of these right hand sides. Okay. Well, once you have these estimates, there is a computationally inefficient algorithm that solves the problem. The, the, the computationally inefficient algorithm says the following. You set up the system. You have some estimates of the right-hand sides that you can do it robustly using this algorithm. And then you just brute force solve this polynomial system. Of course, it's going to run an exponential time, but it will give you a set of parameters that match match the input. And now you might ask, like, what, what good is this algorithm? Well, you could just have done this in exponential time to begin with using some other algorithm. So we'll try to fix this. So yeah. exponential, if, so you've gotten rid of n at this point, so you think this is exponential in d? Is that the n is polynomially related to d. So this is going to be exponential in both n and d. But, uh, so I guess a couple of things. So when you say can estimate these moments up to some accuracy. Yeah. Is it like some order of epsilon? The so one plus epsilon in any in, in a desired notion of norm for indexes. So if you look at every univariate projection, the error in this direction is going to be one plus order of epsilon. Oh, it's a multiple. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, right, but you know you don't want to usually brute force, right? You would want to use the black box algorithm, right? I mean, even if there's no error, we would have used Moitra value. We would have brute force. Exactly, but more value will not work here. Okay. But yeah, there is an inefficient algorithm. All I want to convey is that you can estimate the right-hand sides. And there is an inefficient algorithm, and the bulk of the work will be the design and efficient algorithms. Yes. So why does uh, uh, Moitra not, doesn't work here? Um, there are errors in this estimates that are created adversarially. Yes. Like all I'm giving you is a robust estimate of the mean, the robust estimate of the covariance, etc. If you run with a valiant, like you can show like step one breaks, step two breaks, etc. So does the fact that you assume that things are like only epsilon off and key distance not save you here? Like so it saves you in the only way that you can get a one plus epsilon approximation to these moments. And that, that's the only saving grace. And then you have to argue why this is OK. OK. So this one slide is going to be for the experts. What you can try to do is you have a system of polynomial equalities. You can relax it to a sum of squares, convex programming approach to this system, and ask, like, solving this, does solving this suffice? And this is an open question. I tried this for a while. I cannot show that an SOS relaxation actually recovers the true components. So it's a really nice, clean open question of how to do this. What we end up doing is, uh, is a bit different. So our observation is that you can estimate these right-hand sides robustly. And now, if you really look at the left-hand side, this is some function. This is in the, for k equals 2. For the second moment, this is just a matrix. For higher moments, this will be like an m, m tau the tensor from the upper moment. This is only a function of the parameters. So one could hope that you can run a density decomposition algorithm to recover these parameters. Okay, so that's going to be our meta approach. We're going to try to run a density decomposition algorithm. And the question one can ask over here is, can we take a linear combination of these tensors over here? 
such that at the end of the day, we can just weed out the parameters by running some vanilla tensor decomposition. Okay, so let me make this a bit more concrete. What linear combination am I talking about? I'm talking about these things called Hermit tensors. The definition of a Hermit tensor is not critical. This is a lot of notation. But all I want to convey from here is that if I look at the Hermit tensor of order M for a Gaussian with mean mu and covariant sigma, the only, the only terms that appear in this expression are terms of the, of the following form. So you have sigma minus i, this is the covariance, minus the identity. So some of the terms of the look like this, and the other terms look like the mean. Okay, so this is a tensor that only has the parameters that we want to run. So if you have an estimate of this tensor, maybe we can run a tensor decomposition algorithm to re recover these parameters. And what is M again? M, M, M is the order of the tensor. So M could be two, four, six. Oh, this is for one gauss. This is for one gauss. Ah, okay. Think of this as like the analog of moments. So the reason we're not using moment tensors is that they have like this bad form. Like it's not really clear how to read off the parameters from the moment tensor. Yeah. So we're looking at this auxiliary tensor. Okay. Um, if the tensor notation was too complicated, let me consider the following special case that hopefully clarifies the picture. So let's go back to this case where you have these two mixtures, uh, two components in one block. Let's say their means, um, their means are all zero. So let me assume that the means are all zero. And my mixture just looks like W1 and sigma one and W2 and sigma two. But you know, I can generalize this to higher. If I want to consider the special case where the means are all zero, the covariances are distinct, and I just want to learn the covariances. Okay. I'm also going to restrict to the case where I'm only considering the fourth order tensor, the fourth order, order Hermit tensor. Okay, in this case, the expectation of this tensor is going to be the following expression. Bear with me now. So for now, let's just hide this symmetric part. If you hide the symmetric part, it's just a weighted combination of a tensor of sigma i minus the tensor group itself. This uh, symbol is just the tensor product. Yeah. Maybe you have some uh, of that uh, method. Uh, can you give us some solution? For example, this one is from tensor. Well, what happens when you have this one method? Um, you get the linear combination of powers of x. So of, of, of the mean, which will be like mu to some power and this variance which will be sigma to some power. Okay, <laughs> you can consider the case where X is one dimensional here, right? This is just going to be sigma squared minus I, like sigma minus I squared. Does that help? You get even powers of sigma and, and the corresponding power of mu so that it is one right? But for now, mu is zero. Oh, so they generate an expectation of some polynomial. That's right. So the Hermit polynomials are orthogonal for Gaussians. Okay, so why they appear is not very important. What what we really want to use here is the structure of this tensor when we look at the expectation over or the input. So if I do not have this, uh, you know, symmetrization of operation that I'll just define, this would just look like sigma i minus the identity tensor with the cell. And what I could hope for is like to run tensor decomposition and the output of the tensor decomposition would be these sigma i's. Okay, but this symmetrization complicates the situation a bit. So this operation does the following. It takes every four tuple of indices and it averages over the values of these four tuples. So it's this complicated operation that averages over, you know, all permutations of G1, G2, G3, G4. And the resulting tensor is what you observe. Okay, any questions about the definition of this? So we can forget everything that I said beforehand and just focus on this tensor itself. You get to see this as input, and from this, you're trying to recover the same values. This is our goal now. Maybe I'll give, maybe I'll pause here and let people formulate a question. Yeah. 
that inner tensor like not symmetric to begin with? Like it seems like if you're assuming that a Gaussian is symmetric, then whatever you do with the like perfect information should already be what you expect. Like, is there like a good reason for that? Or is it just like technical? So it, it's just that when you evaluate this definition, you take the expectation over the input, or, and you plug in m equals four, you'll, you'll get this expression. It's, it's, it's nothing magical. I mean, if you looked at the word, like, okay, let me go back here. This one is pretty clean and symmetric. This is the moment that said it. But this doesn't work for us because it, running density composition on this doesn't give you the right parameters. So in some sense, I, because we're subtracting out this identity that it's not already symmetric for free. Right. Okay, so let me try to convince you that solving this density composition problem is interesting. So one thing that you could try is to use vanilla off-the-shelf density composition algorithms. And you can ask whether this works. And I claim it doesn't because if you look at this tensor, the symmetrization operation is making this tensor high rank. Like it's doing all this averaging over inputs uh, of the tensor, which takes a tensor that might be of low rank and make it a tensor of high rank. Okay, so that already breaks. And even if you did not have the symmetrization operation, if you just had the tensor without the symmetrization, standard algorithms will not work because there are no degeneracy assumptions on the signal size. So the components of the tensor, we're not assuming they're incoherent or random or independent and so on. So you can't use off the shelf methods to solve this. Okay, hopefully I've convinced you that this is an interesting problem, uh, just algorithmically independent of anything that I discussed before. Okay, and Karg, Kayal, and Saha agree with us. <laughs> They considered this exact problem and, and the generalization of it, and they wanted to recover the parameters given such a symmetrized tensor. Okay. And what they showed was that they can actually recover the components in the case where you have this tensor exactly. And their algorithms re rely on the algebraic structure of, of this tensor. So if there is no error in constructing this tensor, you can, you can recover the components using their algorithm. They mention as an open question to handle even benign noise. So not adversarial noise, just noise generated in estimating the sensor from samples. So it's open to even estimate the sensor from samples in their way. Yeah. So I assume noise invariant is not based on tensor distribution. No. But uh, uh, so both this paper and the all three of them, they rely on the but this paper is not trying to solve mission with sense, it's just trying to solve this density composition question. Then we abstract it up. Okay. Okay, so how do we recover the parameters? This brings us to a, a technique that we introduced called this decodable density composition. And the first thing I'm going to try to do is to relax the goals. So now I'm not going to try to recover the parameters of this tensor. I'm going to try to recover a list such that the list contains one set of parameters that is close to the parameters of this tensor. The next thing I'm gonna relax is that in the list, I'm not actually going to be close to the true parameters. I'm going to be close to the original sigma i, this is the covariance, up to two forms of error. So the two forms of error I'm denoting by these matrices E and L, where this E matrix has small Frobenius star. So like if I sum over the entries of this matrix, it's small. And this L matrix can have really large norm, but its rank is going to be small. Okay, so I have relaxed my goal to this weird notion of parameter recovery, where I don't recover the input, you know, in any meaningful motion of closeness, apart from just there is some term which is small and Frobenius norm and some term which is low rank. And at this point, you should be asking like, why does it suffice to learn sigma i up to a low rank matrix? Like, why should this ever be enough? The low rank matrix can contribute like really large error. And this is where Eric's question comes in of why we had to cluster to begin with. Since we clustered to begin with, our covariances are now bounded. We know an upper bound on the norm of the covariance. Okay? And we can brute force search over all rank case part matrices 
which are the low rank error and try to recover one which is close. And this brute force search only increases the size of our list. But since I relax the problem to only output a list, this will help us output potentially a long, longer list. Okay. Here I'm just saying that brute force search or case by matrices that only gives us a larger list. Okay, any questions about our high level approach of why it suffices to uh, you know focus on recovery guarantees of this form where we recover a low rank term and a small error from the start? Yeah. So I can ask you later too, but uh, this the rank is bounded, right? Rank is a constant. I mean, each case is a constant. Yes. Then it shouldn't be a hard problem. Right? Like, uh, a lot of the difficulties for other methods is because the rank is also going into dimension. Here for you, the rank is just a constant. So if you do a net search, or something. that's exactly what we, we are claiming here, right? Like you can recover the rank term by doing a net search. Okay. That's why it suffices to output up to low rank error. But now the question is how do you output up to low rank error? So that's that's going to be the next thing that we address. So I've, I've tried to argue that you know outputting an estimate in this notion, you know, of an error which is just low rank suffices. Hopefully, you buy the intuition for why this suffices. The question is now how do we output something up to the right error? Okay, once you have the list, you just try all the combinations. That... Right. So once you have a list, you can run a tournament at the end. This is like a standard tool. And statistics and figure out what the best set of hypotheses in your list is. Any other questions? Okay, so here I just have the reformulation of the problem where we where we say it suffices to output a list. And in, in the list, you need one one set one set in the list needs to be close to the true parameters up to these two notions of error. Okay, so now actually let me tell you the algorithm for doing it. The algorithm is quite simple. So what we're going to do is we're going to randomly project two modes of the tensor. This is a fourth order tensor. We're going to randomly project two modes of the tensor. Okay. And we're going to repeat this process four k times. Okay. So far, it's a fairly easy algorithm. You could even implement it. Um, now we're going to try all possible linear combinations of the four k collapse tensors, which are going to be matrices. So if you take a four tensor collapse to a as you get a matrix. You're taking all possible bounded linear combinations of these four K matrices. And the claim is that one linear combination is going to be sigma i plus something which is more. Okay, so I don't expect you to have any intuition for why this stupid algorithm works. But at least the description of the algorithm should be fairly straightforward. Yeah. What do you mean by bounded linear combination? Right. Exactly. So the coefficients are bounded. Like I'll take linear combinations of these matrices, but I don't have like extremely large coefficients on each one. So like are these constant? Like wait, is this like oh I try one, two, and three? Or yeah, I'll try to grid over you know minus hundred to hundred if my coefficients are bounded by hundred and absolute. Okay, so this is notation for what it means to uh, take a four tensor and collapse it. I don't want to get too bogged down by notation, but essentially, if I look at the resulting matrix and I look at the G1, uh, J1, comma J2 coordinate of this matrix, it does the following. It takes the rest of the indices, which are J3 and J4, and it sums over the entries in the tensor of J3 and J4 and multiplies them by these Gaussians. This is what I mean by collapse two modes of the tensor uh, using random Gaussians. Okay, and it's easy to see that the resulting thing that I get is actually a matrix. This is going to be a D by D matrix. Okay, uh, the details here are not that important. I can, I'm just trying to show you that you can implement this algorithm. It's fairly easy to describe. And now, what do I mean by taking all possible linear combinations? So I can search over some domain minus the domain for these alpha sub Ls. So for each L in one to four K, I can take a linear combination of the matrices that I got by collapsing these tensors. So just an implementation of the algorithm. First page, or the last page, the details of this are not too important. And the claim is that 
you know, for some setting of the alpha L's, this matrix S hat is going to be close to the actual covariance that we care about plus some lower end error. Okay, let me quickly give a sketch for why you would ever expect this to be true. Um, okay, so let's say I focus on one component in this symmetrization. So let's say I just focus on the first component. So I think of I as being one. This is the symmetrization of this tensor. And just to simplify notation of it, let MI be the following matrix. It's sigma I minus the NFA. Okay, so then I'm gonna try to con convert, I'm gonna try to get a convenient expression for the symmetrization operation. And here's one. So the J1, J2, J3, J4 entry of the symmetrized tensor looks, as the, looks like the average over the following terms. So I take MI, I take G1 and J2 with coordinate of this, I multiply it by J3, J4, this is one term. And I average over all permutations of J1, J2, J3, J4. Okay, that's a mouthful, but what I want to keep, what I want you to take away from this is that this expression has some nice form in terms of the actual parameters that we care about. Okay, and now what we're going to try to do is collapse two coordinates of, of this tensor. So let's say we collapse J4 and J3 and J4. All right, so what does this operation do? So let's focus on this term to begin with. If you recall the definition of collapsing, which you shouldn't because I went through it very quickly, believe me that it does the following operation. It sums over coordinates J3 and J4. This term remains constant since it does not depend on the coordinates of the collapsing tensor. And this is some constant. You know, we can pull out. Don't worry about the exact expression. What I want to, you to get from, from this slide is that the J1, J2 coordinate of the resulting collapse tensor is just going to be the J1, J2 coordinate of MI, which is the parameter that we get to learn to begin with. Okay. So we have something, you know, if you combine this into matrix form, after collapsing the tensor, this looks like a matrix times a constant. The matrix that we care about times a constant. Okay, let me quickly look at what happens to this step. So here we are summing over the J3s, that is just localized to this term, and the J4s, which is localized to this term. Now, if you sit down and try to write these terms as a matrix, you can write this as a cone matrix and write this as a null matrix. And you'll basically see that this is a rank one matrix. So if I look at the outer product of these vectors, I'll get a matrix of this form as I sum over J1 and J2. And you can repeat the same argument for, for this last time over here. And the high level takeaway from this is that if you do this collapse, you'll get a resulting matrix of the following form. You'll get something that you care about times a fixed constant, plus two, two matrices, which are rank one. So this is why it's like interesting to multiply this tensor along two modes by a random Gaussian. Okay, great. So maybe you can see now where we're headed to it. In this expression, each term, well, mul when multiplied by a random Gaussian along two modes, gives you the parameter that you care about plus some low rank error. And I already showed you why, uh, you know, recovering parameters up to low rank error suffices because you can then brute force over these and then actually get the parameter that you care about. Yeah, that was a lot, but, you know, Let's take a step back from technical details and talk about uh, more interesting things like future directions and non-combustion. So the first one here is that can we obtain a mixture that is O tilde close to the input in total variation distance, where this O tilde only hides log one or epsilon factors. In our case, we get poly epsilon, which is definitely not information theoretically optimal. We can hope for such a guarantee, but we don't know. Okay, another question is to improve the dependence on one over epsilon and the sample complexity and not like The third question that I mentioned was the polynomial system that we can consider by estimating the moments robustly, does a sum of squares relaxation of this system suffice to solve the problem? And again, we don't know how to do this. And finally, more generally, how far beyond Gaussians can we really go? So all, all this talk was like reliant on the 90% of your data looking Gaussian, 
That may not be the case, but how far can we push this assumption? Can we even solve the clustering problem for, say, you know, a more general family of distributions like log concave distributions? Um, and this is open even for special cases such as uniform distribution or LP balls, and it's open even in the non-requester. Okay, I'll stop there.